So we finally have to talk about the biggest deal in memory arrays, the hardest subcircuit to design, which is row decoders. Row decoders are particularly important because they represent a good chunk of the total delay while reading and also while writing. Uh, and that's because row decoders have to drive the word lines and word lines are often, more often than not, very resistive which makes their total delay, the word line delay, significant. But it's also important because whereas word line delay is large, there are things we can do about it. And that's because the row decoder itself is an active element. It has active drive. And therefore, we can do a lot of smart things about designing and sizing the row decoder so that we minimize the word line delay. This is not the, the case, for example, with cell delay, where we don't have a lot of options. Uh, or it's not the case with pre-charge delay, where the options are really clear. With row decoder delay, with word line delay, it's actually a big open question. So once again, a row decoder is a true decoder, meaning that it is a circuit element which has inputs, uh, n inputs, and produces two part n outputs. There's only one active output in the row decoder, uh, it could be active high, uh, as is the case in uh, no ROMs and in SRAMs and DRAMs, or it could be active low, as is the case in NAND ROMs and NAND flash memories. But the only distinguishing fe feature is there's only one active element at a time. It's also important to notice that sometimes we can disable the entire, entire output of the row decoder so that every single line is disabled. This has to be the case, for example, when pre-charging to avoid um, uh, any uh, pull-down network being activated at the same time as the pre-charged network. But this is just a small modification to the outputs of the row decoder. So in essence, a row decoder is uh, a, a circuit which uh, uh, asserts only a single output at a time. And at a fundamental level, the row decoder is just a set of AND gates and each of these AND gates is going to be uh, enabled. It's going to have its output equal to 1, only for a unique combination of the inputs to the row decoder. And so here we have uh, address lines numbered from A0 to A5, meaning that we have a 6-bit um, address to the row decoder. And just to make things easier for the row decoder, we provide not only the true forms of the address bits, but also their complement form. So we have uh, 12 uh, horizontal lines running horizontally, A0, A0 bar, A1, A1 bar, and so on, uh, up until uh, A5 and A5 bar. And then each of these AND gates at the bottom is going to accept a unique combination of uh, true and complement forms. And so uh, it's so either going to accept A0 or A0 bar, either A1 or A1 bar, and it has to accept six input bits in either true or complement form. And so D0, for example, is going to be true for uh, A0 bar, A1 bar, A2 bar, A3 bar, A4 bar, A5 bar. D1, on the other hand, is going to be uh, all of them in complement form except for A5, and DN1 is going to be all of them in true form. And this guarantees that each of these outputs from the AND gates is going to be true for a unique combination of uh, address bits, and that all of the other outputs are going to be uh, disabled at the same time. And so when you think about it, uh, we have six input bits to, the, uh, to, the, to this decoder, and so we are going to need two to the power of six AND gates. We're going to need 64 AND gates. These AND gates correspond to the outputs of the row decoder. And so we have six bit inputs and we have two to the power of six outputs. Each of them will be provided by one of these AND gates. And therefore, we have as many AND gates as we have outputs from the row decoder. And so it seems that it's really easy. Like uh, the row decoder is actually extremely easy to design. And there's really not much we can do about it, except that it isn't. First of all, the logical effort of an AND gate increases substantially as you increase uh, the number of inputs. So if we ignore for a minute that these are AND gates and just think of them as NAND gates, each NAND gate is going to have N, N MOS transistors in the PDN and uh, N branches of PMOS transistors in the pull-up network. 
so this means that we have uh, n plus 2 as the input capacitance of the transistors in the NAND gate, and uh, the input capacitance of the unit inverter is 3. So this is the logical effort of an in n input NAND gate, which means that as the size of the row decoder increases, the logical effort of its gates increases uh, proportionately. Uh, an increase in the logical effort of the gates at the output of the row decoder means that there's a reduction in their ability to drive the output capacitance. More logical effort means less of the total effort being expended to drive the electrical effort, which means more word line delay. So the bigger the row decoder, the bigger the word line delay, which is obviously something you would expect. I mean, it was, it was the same case with column decoders, but for column decoders, the increase was logarithmic. That's number one. And number two, there wasn't much you can do about it. Here, there isn't much we can do about it either because we're not giving ourselves the chance to do any kind of optimization because we have a single gate in, in, in the path of each output. And there's nothing you can do about a single gate. You cannot optimize its delay. So that's number one. Number two is that as you increase the size of the decoder, the sizes of these gates, meaning their layouts, also increases. So assuming that you have um, a standard cells for arbitrarily large uh, NAND gates, the size of each of these standard cell layouts is going to increase uh, as you increase the size of the gate. And that means that the, this row decoder is going to increase in size. And not only so, but the distance between each output line and the other is going to increase as these uh, NAND gates increase in size. Now, this forces us to use word lines which are spaced apart, more spaced apart, which reduces the pitch in the array, reducing the density of the array, just because we are using row decoders that don't have a favorable layout. So now the size of the memory is dictated by the decoder rather than by the core, which should always be the case. The size, the area size of the memory should be dictated by the core rather than by the accessory circuits, which is why we have to reconsider the fact that we implement um, each path in the row decoder using a single NAND gate. Now, that is you know, using a huge assumption, which is that we actually have arbitrarily large NAND gates available in the standard cell library. This is not usually the case. There are usually only uh, small NAND gates available, two input, four input, and so on. And if you want to make a large uh, fan in NAND gate, you have to use smaller NAND gates to build it. So if we are going to use, if the synthesizer is going to use smaller NAND gates to build the larger NAND gates anyway, why not? Why don't we do that manually? Meanwhile, opening up the chance for optimization, both in terms of layout and in terms of delay. And the way to do this is to actually divide the row decoder into a row pre-decoder and a row final decoder. We use the pre-decoder final decoder architecture to implement column decoders. And uh, over there, it was just like a nice little thing we can do. Uh, here, it's actually a necessity. We cannot implement row decoders without using this architecture. So here we have a pre-decoder, and this pre-decoder produces a number of lines that, produce, that run uh, vertically. And then there's a small final decoder uh, at the output of the, the row decoder. And uh, the main reason we do this is for pitch, for area density. So this allows us to use very small gates at the outputs here, which reduces the pitch between these gates and allows us to return to uh, uh, row decoder drivers that are more in line with the size of memory cells. This is particularly important for memories which have a small cell, uh, so it's not as critical for SRAM as it is, for example, for DRAM or for flash memories. And so what is a row pre-decoder? How does it look like? And what does the final decoder look like? They're actually still AND gates. So there's nothing really weird happening here. It's just AND gates. So instead of creating a six input AND gate in one fell swoop, we create it using a bunch of steps. Here we are creating it using two steps. So in the first step, we are uh, using two input 
AND gates. And in the final step, we are using uh, three input AND gates. And so the pre-decoder here consists of two input AND gates, and the final decoder consists of three input AND gates. And so if you consider what's happening in the pre-decoders, they are combining uh, each pair of address lines to produce pre-decoded address lines. And so this line running vertically, instead of being a single address bit, is a couple of address bits. And so we have here A0 bar, A1 bar. But A0 and A1 have four possibilities. And so you have four lines co corresponding to each of the four possibilities. We do the same with A2 and A3 and A4 and A5. So now we have um, 12 lines running vertically, and from these 12 lines, each final decoder AND gate can pick three lines, and it has to pick one line from each set to produce a final answer. And so if it chooses this line, it's choosing A0 bar, A1 bar, and if it chooses this line, then it's choosing A2 bar, A3 bar, and this one is A4 bar, A5 bar, and so it produces D0 which is the output of the decoder for the first combination of address bits. And so on, we can create um, all the outputs of the decoder. We can guess how many um, AND gates we need in the pre-decoder and the uh, final decoder. We can see actually that we need 12 AND gates in the pre-decoder, and we can guess that we need as many output uh, AND gates in the final decoder as there are outputs from the uh, row decoder, which is in this case a 6 by 64 address decoder, so we need 64 of these guys. Now, um, we chose to have a pre-decoder which is 2 bits long in this implementation, and a final decoder which is 2 bits long, uh, which is 3 bits long. We can also choose the opposite. We can have a 3-bit pre-decoder and a 2-bit final decoder. As you can see, if you compare these two, all we are doing is we are uh, trading off the complexity of the pre-decoder and the final decoder. In the implementation at the bottom, we are using um, uh, bigger pre-decoder uh, gates, and we are using more of them. Uh, and what we gain instead is simpler final decoder AND gates. In fact, this is, um, this is the a table showing the trade-offs we can have between the pre-decoder and the final decoder for a 16 by 2 power 16 decoder. So this is a decoder that has 65,000 more or less um, output lines. And we can choose to have the final decoder be uh, 16 input uh, and the uh, uh, pre-decoder being one input. In that case, there's no pre-decoder. We are just using one single uh, AND gate to produce the outputs, and it has to be 16 input uh, uh, long. And the disadvantage of this is that we have a very large pitch between these AND gates and the final decoder. At the other extreme, we could have nothing in the final decoder, and we can have all of the complexity in the pre-decoder. And this solves the pitch problem. It pushes all of the complexity down to the pre-decoder, but it has a disadvantage. And that disadvantage is that we don't have any driver uh, working horizontally. And so um, when, we, when you look at the architecture, um, th these gates are driving the word line. In that option, we would be driving the word line through this whole distance without anything in the middle. And so we have a very long line running vertically and horizontally, which is being driven by just the pre-decoders at the bottom. And so obviously these two extreme cases are not useful or practical, and we have to find one of these uh, cases that is, uh, uh, you know, more practical. So the question is, should we, uh, the general question is, should we push push more complexity to the pre-decoder or push more complexity to the final decoder? Should we keep them more or less uh, along the same lines? Uh, and the answer is, uh, we should normally push most of the complexity to the pre-decoder. In fact, we will always assume that the final decoder is only a two input uh, AND gate. And therefore, um, most of the decoding is happening in the pre-decoder. And we just have a final AND gate in the final decoder to provide some drive for the word line itself. So uh, we are going to make a choice to, uh, uh, to ensure that most of the complexity happens in the pre-decoder. Now, the other 
question is when you have a complex predecoder, that complex predecoder is going to have large NAND gates uh, or AND gates. In this case, we the largest for the practical situations are eight input AND gates. First of all, AND gates are going to be implemented using NAND gates followed by inverters. That's fine. But the question is, do you implement this eight input AND gate as an eight input AND gate or as a sequence of smaller AND gates? For example, here we can implement the eight input AND gate as two four input AND gates followed by a two input AND gate, or we can have it as three stages of two input AND gates. And the answer to this is that we will definitely choose this second option. Although it might look like we are passing through more stages, which means more delay, the fact of the matter is when we have more stages, that means a longer chain and a longer chain using logical effort methods allows us to do more optimization to reduce the total delay of the chain while driving the output capacitance. And this is our objective. So in short, when we start designing raw decoders, we're going to use very simple final decoders, pushing most of the complexity to the pre-decoder. And secondly, we're going to assume that every AND gate is implemented using two input NANDs and inverters.